our second speaker, um, Associate Professor Dr. Eric Thompson um, from the Department of Sociology, uh, National University of Singapore. He has a PhD in Sociocultural Anthropology from University of Washington in the US. Please. Okay, I'm gonna, um, gonna read this uh, talk. Is this working? Yeah? Right. Um, I want to uh, begin, first of all, thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, present at this uh, 80th anniversary seminar for Thomas Hyde University. Uh, today I'm going to speak on the topic of reframing circular migration and specifically draw on some of the research I've been conducting in Thailand and Singapore over the past several years. Next slide. My presentation today will be in two parts. I'll begin with a bit of background on migration research, and in order to talk about, sorry, in order to talk about um, how and why we need to reframe and widen the scope of how we think about circular migration, I want to briefly discuss the development of migration research within the global social sciences. The second part of my talk, I'll draw on research or my own research based in Thailand and Singapore to provide suggestions of how attention to migration from an ethnographic or migrant point of view allows us to theorize migration from the ground up, so to speak, rather than from the top down. And when I say theorize migration here, I want to emphasize that my point is not to make migration abstract, but rather to better understand migration. That is to develop theoretical frameworks that help us to better understand how and why migration shapes the world that we live in today. In particular, I will discuss the idea of thinking of cities as theaters of accumulation from a migrant's point of view, both in the context of rural to urban migration and transnational migration. Next slide. Okay. Migration research has, lo has a long history in the modern social sciences. For example, it may be remembered that some of the most important work of Franz Boas, who is the founder of American anthropology, which is my own discipline, focused on immigrants coming from Ellis Island to the Americas from Europe. Such research in the realm of international migration focused on and was framed in terms of uh, immigration from certain countries, such as, or immigration to certain countries, such as America, and emigration from countries in Europe, such as Ireland, Italy, and other, one, other uh, European countries. Migration in terms of immigration was assumed to be permanent and permanently transformative. So people left Europe or Asia or Africa behind and came to America and became Americans. The questions that researchers were interested in well into the 20th century were primarily ones of integration and acculturation. How could people shed their old identities and develop new ones? For example, how many generations would it take for such a transformation to be complete? A second line of research was on rural to urban migration. This has often been treated as wholly separate from international or transnational migration. And although it is not the main focus of my talk today, I would argue that it is useful for us to place these two sorts of migration within the same analytical frame. I will not go into that issue in detail here, but I would note that I'm implicitly doing this in, in the talk today. So rural to urban migration has been an important topic throughout the world, not only in Europe and the Americas, including important work on the subject in Latin America, but also of great significance in Africa and uh, certainly here in Asia. Research on rural to urban migration has been wrapped up uh, in a greater interest in the social sciences in the broader worldwide transformation to modernity, which I use here simply as a shorthand for these complex interrelated processes of urbanization, industrialization, de-agrarianization, and, and the like. One parallel with the research on international migration is the ways in which rural to urban migration was seen as permanently transformative, or at least potentially so. One strand of research from the mid 20th century for example, focused on the figure of peasants in cities, examining the extent to which rural to urban migrants might reproduce village or rural life within cities. And more broadly, researchers were interested in how the movement from rural villages to primate cities 
produced urban cosmopolitan subjects. By the mid 20th, or by the mid to late 20th century, however, researchers started to notice something perhaps unexpected, that some international migrants, and even more so rural to urban migrants, did not move permanently from one place to another, from village to city or from their home country to another country and stay there, but rather returned or circular migration registered as an important phenomenon. Rural to urban and international migrants frequently returned to live in the villages or countries of their birth. In addition, researchers began to realize the great significance of remittance economies where money as well as commodities were sent back home, be it to villages or to countries of origin. Next slide. Now, by now, from the late 20th century into the current decades of this century, the first few decades we're in, migration research is becoming more complex and diversified from its earlier incarnations. Now, this is not to say that all of the earlier questions about integration, culturation, remittances and the like have been settled. Rather, new trends in migration and mobility have opened up a wide range of new questions. The dominant tropes of social science over the last couple of decades at least with regard to migration and mobility, have been globalization and neoliberalization. These have come to replace, or at least in large part supersede earlier broad concerns around Cold War, Cold War struggles between capitalism and communism, or about third world development. Research and critiques of neoliberalism, of course, stem from the more or less worldwide triumph of capitalism from the 1990s onward. And globalization is again a shorthand to describe the shrinking of the world, so to speak, through rapid mobility and telecommunications, which, uh, of course, David Harvey, for example, classically described in terms of time-space compression in his 1989 book, The Condition of Postmodernity. Both general concerns about globalization and neoliberalism have sharpened research's attention to issues of migration and mobility. There is no doubt that we live in a highly mobile world and a key challenge for the social sciences has been to come up with approaches to understanding a mobile world when previous frames of research such as society, culture, nation, state and the like were, origi were originally conceived as largely immobile objects of research more or less fixed in time and space. Here of course we think of some of the influential work uh, trying to go beyond those frames. You can think of, of course, um, apoderized ideas of variously intersecting scapes of people, media, finance, and the like, which has been highly influential and suggestive, as has earlier work of apoderized along with Kapitov and others of the social life of things. Research in the 1990s in particular began to look at commodity chains, global assembly lines, and more recently, global ch uh, care chains. In this context, or it is in this context, that I seek to highlight two things in my talk today. The first is an expanded view of circular migration. The original idea of circular migration remained a relatively static one, of people moving from point A to point B and back. So completing a circle, right? From the village to the city and back, or from their home country to another country and back. I want to suggest here that we need an approach to our research not with a predetermined idea of circular migration as describing a circle moving simply from point A to point B to, and back again, but rather thinking in terms of circulation. That people, commodities, ideas, and the like circulate among multiple sites and in complex and uneven ways. The goal of research into migration and mobility is to identify the how and why of multiple interacting circuits of migration and, uh, and of mobility and how they operate. The second and perhaps more specific idea that I want to explore in this talk is the idea of cities as theaters of accumulation and sites of distribution. I'm drawing here on classic work of Armstrong and McGee in the 1980s, but as, as I'll explain shortly, I, my, what I'm doing in my own research and thinking is to actually invert their paradigm, to look at the city as a theater of accumulation, not from the top down, but from, and, and from the point of view of global capital, but rather from the bottom up, in the point of view of migrant subjects. Next slide. 
Okay. Okay, before proceeding with the more specific reflections on some of the research I've done in Thailand and Singapore, I want to lay out some of the general questions that this research seeks to address and questions that I think can be asked more generally by social researchers examining migration and mobility in the world today. First, what and where are the key sites of accumulation and distribution or redistribution of capital and commodities? I would suggest that we think in terms not only of financial capital, but social and cultural capital as well. Second, how do these sites interconnect? By whom and through what means? Or how are they interconnected? Third, who and what, who or what are the actors or agents in the circuits of accumulation and distribution? Fourth, who and what circulates and also who and what does not circulate at the same time? Fifth, how are and why are circulation of people, things, capital, ideas enabled or restricted? And sixth, who benefits, who's empowered, who's disempowered, and why within these circuits? And finally, what methods can we employ in order to approach these answers, um, or in, in order to approach answers to these questions? A world of high and rapid mobility has proven challenging, if not devastating, to some traditional research methods, such as the social survey, that rely heavily on assumptions of fixed and relatively unchanging populations. Increasingly popular is the approach of multi-sided ethnography and process tracing of people, things, and ideas. So let me say before continuing that, that I will by no means be answering all of these very broad questions. I just wanted to lay them out now um, uh, to pose them as uh, frames that we can use and that uh, multiple researchers can use in pursuing questions such as the ones that I'm pursuing here. Okay, next slide. Right. I'll turn now to some research that I've been doing in Thailand and Singapore over the last several years as they relate to the broad issues of migration and mobility discussed so far. I'll be comparing Bangkok primarily as a site of rural to urban migration and Singapore as a site of transnational migration. Of course, I want to say that there is important transnational migration taking place in Bangkok as well. And while Singapore does not have a national rural hinterland to speak of, many migrants to Singapore come from rural places elsewhere. So I don't want to overly typologize these two cities uh, as involving only one or the other sort of migration. That being said, I want to highlight some of the interesting parallels between Bangkok as a site of rural to urban migration and Singapore as a site of transnational migration. Most importantly, both operate <coughs> as migrant theaters of accumulation for projects cited elsewhere. And given the constraints of time also, I'll be talking mainly about Bangkok with somewhat shorter uh, comments on Singapore. Next. All right. So very briefly, my uh, research in Thailand over the past few years has been on rural to urban migration under, first, uh, under two projects, actually. One is a multi-researcher grant on the topic of urban aspirations and a smaller grant on circular migration and rural gentrification. In both cases, I've been working with migrants from the Northeast or Isan region who are moving from villages, both from the, move, who are migrants from villages in the Northeast both to Bangkok and also to Konken, to the city of Konken. Uh, although most of the work in Konken remains to be done, so what I'm going to talk here is just about Bangkok. Next. All right, uh, this is just my standard map to show people where Isan is. I don't think I can need to explain to this audience where Isan is. Okay, uh, next. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> My research uh, with a team of other colleagues at NUS, all working on various forms of urban aspirations across about 10 countries in Asia, has raised important and interesting questions for me in reflecting on my own research work. The researchers on this project are mainly urban studies experts. But in my case, my starting point is in rural places, interested in the ways in which people from such places interact with urban places and with urban ideas. And this leads me to ask, <clears throat> how do we as researchers and the people that we work with as research subjects spatialize aspirations? How and why, and, and also how and why does this matter? In other words, what makes aspirations particularly urban 
as opposed to rural. Secondly, how do we think about aspirations in concrete ways? For example, to get a job, marriage, family, security, to fulfill filial obligations, or simply to have fun, or in Thailand, a simple aspiration to sanok. Um, thirdly, what are the temporalities of aspirations? Aspirations imply a future orientation. So what sort of time horizons do rural to urban migrants have? And again, how and why does this matter? And finally, how do these temporalities and spatialities of aspirations, how are those two interrelated? Next. Okay. <clears throat> a key argument that I've been developing out of my research with rural to urban migrants in Bangkok, as well as a variety of other research projects, is that for many migrants, the urban or the city is not a site of aspiration itself, but rather it is a site in which or through which rural aspirations can be fulfilled. To mention briefly, uh, my ideas here draw uh, very much on earlier research that I conducted in the 1990s in Malaysia, as well as research in Thailand, Singapore, and Indonesia comparing uh, Thai and Indonesian migrants. And then also the current research on urban aspirations and circular migration and rural gentrification. So this is kind of developing ideas over actually a couple of decades. A first key point is, to ex is, is the extent to which migrants maintain or even further develop their rural identities through processes of migration. In Bangkok, for example, example uh, researchers like myself are always struck by the extent to which migrants from Isan, even after decades of living in Bangkok, describe themselves as Chao Ban, right? Or when we ask what their occupation is, to all the taxi drivers, it's always Tam Na, right? We, I'm a rice farmer, <laughs> right? Driving my taxi, but I'm a rice farmer, right? So that, that identity sort of seems to get in, reinforced in Bangkok if, uh, rather than wiped out as earlier migration researchers might have thought. It's not a transformation to becoming urban necessarily. Uh, in her influential work on my migrant factory workers here in Thailand, Mary Beth Mills described the importance of Tam Samai, which I've never been able to pronounce for Tam Samai, modernity, right? This idea of modernity and the aspirations of young women coming to Bangkok. And no doubt the association of the city with modernity and cosmopolitanism is an important and aspirational to many migrants. But we also find important rural aspirations that migrants hold and which they seek to fulfill through their migration to Bangkok or other cities. From the outset, their goal is not to become part of the city, but rather to use the city as a site to fulfill aspirations, including Pam Samai modern aspirations, back home in their villages through process that I describe as rural gentrification. Next. <laughs> As outlined already, my interest and focus is on rural and migrant subjects acting within fields and processes of large fields and processes of larger forces. This raises a question of whether we think and theorize urban aspirations. Or sorry, this raises questions of whether we think and theorize urban aspirations as well as migrant migration in terms of grand schemes or in terms of opportunistic agency. For example, research that focuses on urban planners or planning perspectives, which some of the researchers in this larger project are focusing on, that sort of research tends to assume that aspirations are framed in terms of grand schemes, such as urban redevelopment projects. By contrast, in working with migrants in everyday contexts, they may well have grand schemes or at least have long-term goals, but their choices tend to be enacted more through opportunistic agency. At a broader scale, how migrants enact their choices, that is how they express their own agency within larger structures of power, are crucially shaped by cultural geographies of expectation. In other words, by the geographies of knowledge they have about where to seek out opportunities. Next. In this context, I want to turn to the ways in which rural migrants think of and experience cities as theaters of accumulation. In doing so, I'm drawing, on insp I'm drawing inspiration from Armstrong and McGee's analysis of cities in Southeast Asia and Latin America as theaters of accumulation. Their original formulation of this idea was developed from a political economic 
Marxist or more specifically dependency theory paradigm that was much in vogue in the 1970s and 1980s. Next. In their book, Armstrong and McGee, this is very complex, don't try to read it all, but uh, this is reproduced from their book. This is their figure to explain their model. So in their book, Armstrong and McGee provide a figure that models their idea of a hierarchy of economic organization in the world system. At the top of the hierarchy are global centers, what we would now call global cities. And at the bottom of the hierarchy are rural hinterlands particularly in the third world countries such as those of Latin America and Asia, but elsewhere in the world as well. Armstrong and, McGee main, Armstrong and McGee's main argument was that cities from the primate global centers such as New York, London, Tokyo, and perhaps today we'd include Singapore, uh, down through national metropolises such as Bangkok, Jakarta, and Manila, through regional centers such as, say, Konken or Chiang Mai, but these cities act as sites or theaters of accumulation that extract surplus value ultimately from the bottom of the hierarchy in rural hinterlands across the globe upwards to accumulate in the primate global cities within the world's most affluent nations. Now those familiar with dependency theory, this sounds very familiar. Okay. Um, next slide. Now, Armstrong and McGee's argument is basically a top-down analysis of the global political economy. My own take on the theoretical framework is not to say that their analysis is wrong, but rather to ad adopt and adapt the theaters of accumulation idea to think about cities from the point of view of rural to urban migrants. In the dependency theory perspective, rural places and people are at the bottom of the hierarchy. They are acted upon and exploited victims of global capitalism rather than active agents in the system. Now this is not necessarily how rural to urban migrants themselves understand or act in the world, which does not make Armstrong and McGee's argument wrong, but it certainly makes it partial. And I want to ask instead, what are the subjective and context-specific conditions through which migrants act within and through these theaters of accumulation? Next. To answer this question, we need to attend to the varied and context-specific aspirations that migrants have, as well as the varied means through which they seek to fulfill those aspirations. Without being able to go into detail here, I'll suggest some of the sorts of aspirations and the means that I have come across in my research through interviews and interactions with Isan migrants, both in Bangkok and several villages around Kong Ken. For some migrants, aspirations simply include fun, excitement, and among other things, sexual encounters. Migra migration is motivated, at least in part, to experience the world, to see new places, to have fun, right, Sanok, everybody wants Sanok, um, and to open up possibilities of sexual or romantic relationships. And this last, in particular, is highly gendered in ways, I'm also a gender studies, I mean, that's one of the things I do is gendered studies, so I can talk about some of the gendered aspects, but. I'll leave it aside for the moment. Uh, migrants, particularly younger migrants, but sometimes older migrants as well, have conjugal aspirations, or aspirations to get married, or at least to have a long-term partner. While this overlaps with sexual aspirations, I see, it as, I see the two as somewhat different, reflecting different aspirations for shorter or long-term relationships. A third set of aspirations are filial aspirations. I find these particularly interesting in the case of Isan migrants insofar as they are strongly shaped by Isan matrilineal and matrilocal traditions. For women, these aspirations center on the desire to fulfill the role as their role as dutiful daughters, a motivation that many other researchers who work with Isan women have noted. For Isan men, there is a parallel but rather different aspiration to be, to be respected sons-in-law. And I don't have time to discuss it here in any detail, but comparing Malay male migrants in Malaysia, who are influenced by patriarchal Islamic traditions, there are interesting differences between the matrilineal Isan men and the patrilineal Malay men in terms of their migrant expe expectations, aspirations, and practices. Another closely related but still distinct set of aspirations are reproductive aspirations. In other words, the desire to have children. Again, how these play out is interestingly and importantly different in different contexts. I find some important differences, again, between matrilineal Isan migrants and patrilineal Malay migrants in this respect. 
And yet again, such aspirations are shaped very differently in the context of transnational rather than rural to urban migration, particularly in places like Singapore, where working class migrants must choose long-term separation from children in order to operate within Singapore as a theater of accumulation. Along with these various personal and kin-related aspirations, there are, of course, material aspirations of wealth and consumption. Although simplistic views of migration look primarily look at it primarily as or wholly driven by material uh, aspirations, my own work and that of other anthropologists and ethnographers find that material aspirations must always be understood in relationship to other sorts of personal and familial aspirations such as those I've just sketched out above. Contrary to neoliberal or simply liberal economic theory, migrant subjects do not act as individualistic, rational choosers but rather as subjects embedded in complex webs and networks of interactions with others. Their material aspirations, while undeniably important, cannot be understood outside such webs of meaning and networks of social relationships. Finally, important spatialized aspects of aspirations are the, rural, are the urban and the rural aspirations of migrants. In earlier work in Malaysia in the 1990s, I found that overwhelmingly Malay rural to urban migrants were by and large leaving the village behind and placing their aspirations and futures more squarely in urban places. Returning to the kampong or the village was a nice nostalgic idea, but at the time, in the 1990s, was not seen as a practical option. And that, interestingly, that's changing in Malaysia. That's another paper altogether. <laughs> Comparatively, it's striking how Isan migrants in Bangkok seem to have near universal rural rather than urban aspirations. The urban sojourn, with some exceptions, is not about establishing an urban life, but rather about enabling rural prosperity through building of houses or purchase of land with money remitted or brought back from the urban, or for that matter, from transnational migration. Now, along with mapping out the varied and intersecting aspirations of migrants, I've also been interested in mapping out the means through which uh, such aspirations are achieved. I've just mentioned a couple here. Education is, of course, one obvious and much sought after means uh, of achieving aspirations, although access to education is limited for many rural to urban migrants. And even for those who have achieved university degrees, for example, they may find them less enabling than they or their parents who funded them may imagine. Work is, of course, another obvious means to fulfill aspirations, particularly material ones, but here again, opportunities and experiences of migrants vary widely. The third means, particularly, although not exclusively for women, is marriage. This is most dramatically the case in the now widespread, widespread figure in Thailand of the Mia Farang, who enter into marriages with foreigners. A recent excellent analysis by um, Sarit and Angeles discusses how transnational marriage allows rural Isan women to jump scale, as it were, and transcend the national realm in which they are significantly disadvantaged, subalterns, and become transnational cosmopolitan subjects with substantial social, cultural, and financial capital, which they often use to greatest effect in transforming their lives in their rural home villages. Migration itself is, of course, yet another means through which migrants, basically by definition, seek to transform their lives and achieve their aspirations. In every case, a complex set of processes both enable and constrain the migratory possibilities of rural Isan subjects, from kinship networks to international borders to labor recruitment schemes, just to name a few of the more obvious. And finally, in conjunction with these, cities present themselves in particular as sites of opportunity, as specific theaters of accumulation in which and through which migrants can transform themselves and their lives. Next slide. My point here is that it is not only global capital for which the cities are theaters of accumulation and diffusion, but for migrants to cities as well. For migrants, the direction of accumulation and diffusion is precisely the opposite direction from that theorized by Armstrong and McGee. In the case of Isan migrants to Bangkok, they are accumulating and diffusing value downward, as it were, from the center to the periphery, from the metropole to the rural. Moreover, this process of accumulation and diffusion is not only about financial and material value. Rural to urban migrants do, of course, accumulate and diffuse or remit wealth and commodities from the city to the countryside, 
but they also accumulate and diffuse things such as status, experience, and cultural tastes. In this sense, as I mentioned previously, as researchers, we need to study more closely the varied so sorts of social, cultural, and other forms of capital that are accumulated and diffused in the process of migration. In these ways, it seems to me that the framework of cities as theaters of accumulation, from the bottom up rather than the top down, is, a, is useful to think with. Though my arguments here remain, of course, preliminary and very much open to debate and discussion. Next slide. Okay, to summarize some of the points uh, or directions of this work on rural to urban migration in Bangkok is taking. The first is to example, examine the temp temporality and spatial, uh, spatiality of concrete aspirations of migrants. The second is to question whether the aspirations of migrants are urban aspirations per se, or whether they are aspirations of elsewhere, specifically rural aspirations played out in and through the urban, but not substantively of the urban. Such aspirations need to be studied carefully within local contexts. For example, as I alluded to before, the aspirations of Isan migrants are shaped in important ways by Isan matrilineal traditions. And finally, by inverting Armstrong and McGee's paradigm, I think that we can usefully understand the rural not simply as dominated by or apart from the urban, but as integral to a broader process, um, a, a br broader urban processes and theaters of accumulation in what is increasingly an urbanized world, particularly in places like Thailand and generally in Asia. Next. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here as quickly as possible. Okay, very quickly, uh, before concluding, let me make some brief comparative comments on Singapore, where I've also been conducting research over the last few years, actually about a decade now, particularly among Singapore's transnational migrant population. In Singapore, with no rural hinterland to speak of, Migration is conceived of entirely within international or transnational contexts. When I even say that I work on migration, people just assume it's transnational, not rural to urban. Of particular significance in Singapore is the new social divide between citizens and non-citizens, which has largely supplanted an earlier social divide uh, along racial lines between Chinese, Malays, Indians, and others. In Singapore today, the population is roughly 60% citizens and 40% non-citizens. An interesting parallel to think about in comparison to Bangkok here is the way in which migrants are perceived as legitimately of or not of a particular city. In Singapore, the framing of migrants as foreign and non-citizens materially and ideologically constrains migrants from establishing themselves and locating their aspirations within Singapore. For 40% of the population, therefore, the city becomes a theater of accumulation par excellence with their futures invested elsewhere. For Isan migrants, there is no national border excluding them from full participation in Bangkok. They are Thai citizens and on that basis considered to have full access and right to the city as any native of Bangkok. But there are, as has been highlighted in particularly unfortunate ways in the past several years, significant social, cultural, and political dividing lines that project Isan migrants as in particular as foreigners, or at least as others within the capital city. Some of this is coming from the discourse of Bangkok natives, but also from Isan subjects themselves, for whom regional senses of identity seem to have grown stronger over the past decades, particularly in the context of the recent political crisis. The bottom line is that migrants' agency and activities within the city and the production of the city as the theaters of accumulation, um, so the, it's the city is produced as a theater of accumulation, but not as a home, and these are strongly shaped by subjectivities of the migrants who are conceived by others and themselves uh, as in the city, but not of the city, whether it be Bangkok or Singapore. Next. Okay, finally, my concluding thoughts. Uh, in this talk, I've sought to provoke some thinking along a number of lines that I see as important to contemporary research on migration and mobility, only some of which I've been able to demonstrate or discuss in, uh, with regard to concrete research. The first is that we need to think, or that we need to work on identifying and understanding circuits of migration and mobility, which may not necessarily be the paths or circuits we might expect based on traditional theory about immigration, rural urban migration, or even circular migration. Second, and closer to the related, I believe that we can trace such circuits of migration and mobility through close attention to the migrants' point of view and experiences and their aspirations. This is to some extent drawing very much on the paradigm of grounded theory and approaching the study and understanding of social and cultural systems, in this case systems of migration and mobility, from the ground up. 
Our research should take us in the direction of describing and understanding emergent systems of migration and mobility produced in our contemporary fluid global system. And finally, all of this is a call for more multi-sided work into the paths of circular migration that are shaping the world we live in today. Next slide. That's all I have to say, cup and cup, and I uh, look forward to your questions and comments.